Is timber frame the best construction out there for home builds? I'll show you how I can do it all on my own using this micro home build project as an example. Some simple old school hacks, keeping fancy tools to a minimum to help you with a foolproof method to get plumb and square. It's great for self builders and solo DIYers. And before I start building, I'll work out my frame dimensions for each wall. I'm using 89 by 38 millimeter CLS stud work. You merchant might call it four by two, and I use CLS for most of my builds. You can also use 100 by 50 treated, or you could go up a size in CLS, 220 millimeter. The CLS standard is regularized and easy to handle with its radius Edges, so you can't go wrong with it really. I'll be using strength rating of C16 and you can check out my other video to get a feel for what that means along with the sizing. You'll often be working with a structural engineer anyway for your exact sizing and centers, but to give you some context, all these mass built two story home builds are built in timber frame using 89 millimeter CLS. They're two story, some are even three story with a brick outer leaf. So for extensions and two story new build homes, you can be safe in assuming 89 millimeter is a good benchmark. For my wall frame design, I'll have a bottom plate or sole plate. I'll have two top plates or wall plates. Ignore all the YouTubers uh, just doing a single rail. Don't shortcut this. You need to double up the top plate to accommodate the point loads of your roof joists, which will rarely land directly over your vertical studs. And these vertical timbers, my wall studs, are at 600 millimeter centers or 24 inches. And I've gone through this with my structural engineer. You might need to bring your centers down to 400 millimeter centers or 16 inches for strength, but that would be unusual. 600 is fine. You want these centers to be the exact sizes for two reasons. First is that you'll be using what we call running dimensions for accuracy, placing the end bracket of your tape measure to the end of your sole plate and marking the centers along. And if you know your six times tables or your four times tables, it's really quick and accurate to go along 6, 12, 18, 24. I want to be working in millimeters, so 600, 1200, 1800. And for inches, it's 24, 48, 72, 96. Both easy to remember and well marked on your measuring tapes. Second, because you'll be working with sheets, OSB for the outside and plasterboard for the inside. These sheets are sized 2,400 millimeters high by 1,200 millimeters wide, eight feet by four feet if you're working in Imperial, which is 2,440 by 1,220 millimeters in metric. So make sure to order the right size of board depending on which system you're using. Once I know my lengths of each panel based on my room sizes and the overall height I want, thinking about ceiling heights as my starting point, I can draw out each panel in elevation. Imagine looking at it lying on the floor since that is how I'll be setting it out in the real world. And then I need to measure the overall length of my timber divided by 4.8 meters since that's the cheapest way of buying these timbers and the standard length and I'll get it delivered by my local timber merchant on pallets and avoid the temptation to buy shorter lengths 2.4 or 3.6 meters from your local DIY store. It will be way more expensive and the smaller lengths involve more cutting and more waste. Now let's start with our first panel and looking at my elevation drawing here, I've got these verticals at 2.1 meters and sole plate and top plates at 4.9 meters based on my plan and my design. And that's a total of 36 linear meters. We divide by 4.8 and round up and which works out to be eight lengths of 4.8 CLS timbers. I'll add our noggings later and after my joists are in place, we use noggings to provide stiffening and as an additional fixing point for our plasterboard sheets. I'll turn the studs horizontally, uh, looking along their lengths, select the straightest ones on the short side for my top and bottom plates. I want them to be as flat as possible to make it easier to get the panels square. We're in the real world dealing with the organic raw materials, so our perfect world architect drawings become just a guide at this point. 
Now you can set up a chop saw on a stand for your cuts, they're a great investment, but as I'm working alone and because this site is so tight for space, there's no room to set up a stand. I'm happier using my speed square and my cordless circular saw. It's just so much faster for me. And I made a few videos about that here, how to use a circular saw safely and set it up and the best saws to buy and the safe way to operate. Now I'll cut my bottom plate and just one of my top two plates for now. And for speed, I'll set my saw depth marginally deeper than my timbers. So in this case, 40, 42 millimeters on my saw as the timber is 38 millimeters deep. And I do that for safety and for the most efficient use of the saw's motor. Also, an old school tip, by placing the top and bottom plates on top of each other and perfectly aligned, when I cut, I can transfer the dimensions from the first plate to the second to get perfectly accurate cuts. Next, I'll line these two rails up on top of each other, working in elevation just like my drawings, and then mark my centers using my running dimensions, and then transfer the mark to a straight line through both timbers using my speed square so I know my wall studs will be in line and dead vertical once the frame is squared. I'm always trying to minimize potential for mistakes by using these easy techniques and use a sharp pencil for this stuff. Sometimes I'll use a felt pen for the camera if I'm filming, but otherwise use a carpenter's pencil and keep your knife in your pocket so you get into the habit of keeping that discipline throughout your work. And if you struggle with that discipline side of things, technology can always save us. And this clutch pencil is a useful alternative, well constructed with its own holster to help in your pocket and a little baby sharpener built into the top. It's a little pricey, but good if you're always rushing with a blunt pencil, you'll lose the accuracy in all that hard work. Do it right. Now it's time to cut my vertical studs. I've got several of exactly the same length to cut for this wall panel alone, but I've an additional three wall panels with the same height, a total of over 40 identical lengths. And rather than measuring every single time and the possibility of errors creeping in as the pencil mark falls a little bit differently each time, I'll use another old school method. I'll make a measuring jig by taking a length of timber. I'll screw in a top rail at right angles. I'll use my set square to get it square and perpendicular, screwed in three places to avoid any rotation. And I'll then take the length of my cut and I'll look at my circular saw guide, measuring from the inside face of my saw blade to the edge of my guide, and then subtract that from my length of timber. And we've just created the simplest cutting jig to do perfect cuts every time. I hope you're beginning to see preparation is more important than the actual cutting. So let's prepare by making a pile of our timbers for our cuts. Each length of timber is 4.8 meters. So for this wall stud panel, I need eight lengths of 2126 millimeter studs. And I can get two lengths of that for each 4.8 meter standard length with around 540 millimeters left. I say around because we need to allow for the thickness of the blade and minor discrepancies in the timbers. Best to at least be aware of this when you're planning. I'll try to use these offcuts somewhere, but they're just gonna be a too small to use as my noggins between my vertical studs. And this is why we always need to allow for wastage when we are calculating our quantities for ordering our building materials. You can check out my ordering template, which will help. Just punch in your total length and it will calculate your quantity. You can use a percentage box for adding a wastage factor. I tend to work between five and 10%, but the less expensive experienced you are, I would increase that number. It's nothing worse than not having enough material on site when you're in the middle of a build. I'll leave a link in the description for you to download. I'm using SketchUp to help me plan all of this out. I draw a simple 3D model with all of the timber studs defined and using the different views, I can quickly generate a cutting schedule to help me with my quantities, transferring to my spreadsheet for my cutting on site, I take a screenshot of this elevation drawing with the dimensions and then transfer it to my phone to refer to as I'm setting up my cuts in the cold and windy weather of 
a Scottish springtime. I'll leave a video in the description which shows a quick tutorial on how you can easily learn this. Uh, selecting our studs, it helps to gauge our timbers, especially if they've been lying outside for a while, like these have. And these are the additional problems you encounter when building alone. Gauging, what does that mean? We need to select the optimal timbers from our delivery pile, leaving the wobbly, knotted and cracked ones for our secondary elements, such as our noggings and infill pieces. I'm going to look along the lengths of each timber for our horizontal rails. If you remember, we looked along this way. For our verticals, we just want to check along the other direction. I'm not super worried about bends on the wide side since I can use our sheets and our noggins to straighten them out a little later. It's the other direction, the plumb direction I'm focusing on. It's a real pain to correct bends on the flat side when you're doing wall studs, so I'm looking to choose the least bendy ones. So now we've got our piles of timbers, it's time to use our jig we made and cut each timber, getting two perfect cuts out of each timber stand in length. And then I'll take our horizontal rails and place them apart so I can space the vertical studs between, making sure I can see the centre marks I made in the horizontals earlier. You can use some 100mm screws in each corner if you want to make sure everything fits. Screws are great because you can unscrew things when you make mistakes. And then we want to nail through the top and bottom rails into the vertical studs to make the frame. I'm using 90mm smooth galvanised nails for my first fixed frame since I don't need to worry too much about tensile forces. It's mainly compression forces in the wall frame and smooth nails work great in that situation and just sink in a little bit easier with the nail gun. You can hand nail it no problem. I'm using the Passload IM360 which has served me well for years and it's just so much faster. I'll go for three nails fitted top and bottom, so six nails for each vertical stud and now I need to square my frame. Now when I'm working alone the easiest and foolproof way I've found is by taking a sheet of OSB, fix it in the corner of my frame with a 50mm screw, make sure you're just using the finished edges of the OSB sheet in case you've cut it somewhere and rotate my wall frame around until it's in line with my sheet. Then I know it's perfectly square and I can go ahead and fix the sheet down using my nail gun and this time I will use ring shank nails as I don't want the sheet to be able to be ripped outwards. I'm I'm using 63mm nails here for my pass load. I'm fixing around 2 to 300mm centres and you might need to lever the frame a bit to get the bends and racking out of the timber to get it square and that's the beauty of using the perfect template of the OSB and once you get your nails in you've got a perfectly square rigid wall panel that will not rack and by fixing my OSB on the frame while it's still on the floor I don't have to worry about getting it square and racking it as I raise it up into vertical. I only need to worry about getting it plumb. Much easier when I'm working on my own like this. If I can't get anyone to help me raise these frames up, I'll remove a sheet or two of the OSB from the frame just to make it lighter. Make sure to keep the ones at the corner. You want it to remain stiff and not to rack there. And I'll wait and not fix the second top rail because both of these things will help to keep the weight down to help me lift it safely. And if it's still too heavy for me, you can slide planks under and do it bit by bit. It can take a while but it works fine and it does save you back. Best thing though, wait for your friends and family to come and give you a help for just a couple of minutes. And then lifting the thing, whether alone or not, I'll have an impact driver and some 100mm torque screws in my work pockets to fix the wall frame into the floor frame and I'll have a hammer and a plank to tap the frame into place. A lump hammer also works. And finally, with the wall in its vertical position, I'll have prepared a diagonal strut to fix to keep the wall stiff whilst I get on with the other frames. I did this whole setup in two shifts of four hours, so if you're prepared you can do the whole lot in a day and you'll need to also consider insulation and membrane. I've made a few videos about that and you can contact me if you've got any specific questions on your project. I'll leave a link in the description below. I'll show you how I plan my wall frames to connect in with each other in another video so that I don't even need a level to make them plumb and I'll show you how I fit for joists, rafters or flat roofs joists when I'm working alone as well. Please give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video, it really helps me out, I promise you. Check out the links below and I hope to see you next time.